Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the organizer for giving the opportunity to address you to today. It's always a great pleasure to, to visit Italy. And um, so, really, today, um, I will tell you a bit about me. Uh, so, I'm indeed based in Oxford. I'm part of the Department of Engineering Science, part of the uh, Oxford e Research Center. Uh, which is a multidisciplinary center that does uh, astrophysics, but also biology data, or um, uh, everything related to data science um, in many different fields. And I'm attached to the group of Dr. S Susanna Sansone, who leads the uh, data readiness group in, in the department. Before that, I spent nearly 10 years at EMBLDI near Cambridge, uh, where I started as a, a, a data scientist in the microarray group at that time, so transcriptomic data. And um, to give you a bit of a perspective, at that time when I joined, Array Express was empty, basically. I am that old. So um, I'll go on, and this is the, uh, the, talk, the talk outline for today, uh, give you, giving you a quick overview. Again, having to spin this uh, towards SMEs as well. So, I, I, in a way, make a connection with the Pistoia Alliance. Some of you probably know the organization. It brings together a lot of the pharma industry. Um, and this is um, really a, a big thank you to do to Ian Arrow, from whom I, I borrowed a number of slides. Uh, then, of course, I will tell you a bit about the FAIR principles. I presume everyone has heard about the FAIR principles by now. Uh, but in case we need a refresher, I will run about that. Uh, then I will tell you about uh, the fair sharing system that we run um, in, in our group, which is a catalogue of uh, standards and resources. Um, then, of course, I would really like to tell you more about the IMR Fair Plus, which is uh, the programme that started about a year ago, and that brings a lot of uh, pharma industry and academic labs to start thinking about the processes around verification process, because it's all very new for all of us and we need to learn how to deal with this. And to do this, I will give you an example of verification process that we run, and in a way that was a very interesting experience. I thought it was easy, and uh, in a way we uh, shared the experience with you and, and to see the kind of pitfalls we run into. Uh, and then I would like to tell you about uh, the FAIR evaluator, uh, which is a tool uh, that allows you to automatically assess the level of fairness to some extent. Uh, and, and this will be, I think, of interest for, for a number of you. So starting with the farm, with the, the Pistoia Alliance uh, uh, input in a way, this is to give you um, an overview about how the landscape has changed over the years. Uh, this is, um, uh, in a way, on the, on the left hand side, you have the way big farmer used to operate. Uh, you know, it's very, very close, close system where everything was developed in-house, the IT was in-house, the discovery, the research, everything was very, very tightly guarded. Uh, as things evolved, and then, you know, interactions started uh, to happen, and we are in a situation today where basically um, a lot of the industry has realized that they need to collaborate, and the data uh, exists outside industry, and needs to be ingested and integrated with the system. And this, in itself, uh, creates a huge amount of curation challenges uh, that we are all familiar with, uh, and basically this is, this is why it's happening. And on the back of this reality, uh, this publication um, uh, about 10 years ago uh, really stated the, the, the need for lowering the, the industry firewalls, really to foster this kind of interactions. And these are, in a way, there are many uh, aspects where interactions could be happening and are, are required to happen. Uh, so ranging from the data itself, how do we make and share curation knowledge, and defining new standards, so resources for recovery annotating uh, elements. And, and of course, as you go up uh, from the data to the standardization efforts to the extraction of knowledge, uh, again, further needs appear. And this is, again, uh, no longer sustainable to do that in every single enterprise. You need to somehow uh, lift it to good faith. And so this was the publication by the Pistoia Ions and the Allotrop Foundation is, in a way, uh, are its examples of such activities that are happening. And so, of course, um, the realization that a lot of public data exists, and it's always a, a very important resource, and we need to integrate that to make the most of it. 
uh, because we can uh, probably uh, identify patterns in those target data sets. So which means that we need to uh, look at them in, in, in really resources and assets that we can mobilize. But what does it take to, to, to do this? And, and really, uh, uh, ultimately, is to achieve this kind of self-describing resource. And when we talk about data, we talk about obviously the raw data files and, and, and things like that, but also we, the, the protocols, the figures, the reports, the slides, uh, the workflow, the computation of workflows, and the code that, has, as, that are associated to, science, to the scientific enterprise. So this, of course, means well, stems from the kind of assumption that better data means better science. And as we um, uh, heard yesterday uh, with Professor uh, Deledone, I think this is, uh, we have to take the, the reuse of public data with a pinch of salt. We have to be critical uh, of what we get, uh, keep an eye, a sharp eye on, on, the, on the problem effects that we, we, can, we can identify. And this is, in a way, sorry, these uh, two very salient headlines uh, that I'm showing here are just quite challenging as well, just a stark reminder uh, of, of the, uh, uh, the quality of the data. Uh, and this is really the core of the work. How do we improve the quality of the, the public data uh, as a group, as a community? Uh, and usually the problem is that we intervene way too late uh, in, in the process of, of management of the data. So on that topic, I think the issue of annotation is critical. And uh, this is really digging back into the origin of the semantic web. Uh, the sentence, a little semantic goes a long way, we can demonstrate this. So um, again, we, we are very capable of producing these kind of things. We can produce instruments, can produce large amount of files uh, very quickly. Um, uh, but if we don't look after those files carefully with providing just-in-time metadata, we, we face the problem of having to open these scans every single time, trying to figure out where they are and, and try this. And this is extremely wasteful and time-consuming. So of course, annotation is good, um, but for those in the back, don't rejoice too much. The metadata says that this, this is dog food. And of course, we don't want to eat dog food, so we want to do something else. Um, we all work very hard, and sometimes I don't have time to cook when I leave the lab, so I've got, luckily, I can pop at a corner store and get off one of those deli cases. And there is a lot of metadata on that thing, which gives me guidance to what I should, should be doing, especially probably uh, vary my diet a bit more. Uh, but the good things about this information is that basically I know that an organization has looked into the quality of, of what is in the tin, so I can be really confident that what I'm eating is of good quality. Um, which means that there are, we need to have organizations that not only think about standardization, the quality of the metadata that is produced, to assessing the data, but also we need to have certification bodies that are able to uh, uh, run these controls. Because what is written on the team doesn't mean that this is exactly what it is. So we need this process to happen. And, and this is where, I guess, for SMEs as well, there, is, uh, op there are opportunities that we need to consider and think, and think about. Um, and of course, I would like to change my diet at some point. Maybe caviar would be nice. It's an empty tin, but well, hope is there. So going back on the uh, on the fair principle now, this is a scientific data publication back in 2016, uh, led by Mark Wilkinson and, and Baron Mons. Um, so everybody has heard about the fair principle by now, I presume. Yes, sure, have hands. Yes, good. So uh, we. We're a bit surprised by the success of the publication to some extent, even though we, we had a feel for uh, the need for that. Uh, but it's now picked up, it has been picked up by the G20, it's been picked up by a lot of funding agencies as a kind of cre critical guidelines for developing infrastructure. And let's dig it in, in, in a bit into this. Uh, one aspect that is essential is that we need to make the data findable. And this means, uh, obviously, for many things, to be able to have an infrastructure that is solid, that is able to produce and mint identifiers for elements. And when we, when we say identifier, this is a bit uh, more demanding as a requirement to, uh, to, in the context of fair data. We mean resolvable, stable, persistent identifier. 
uh, essentially an HTTP request that can be always resolved and available. This is a strong commitment when you start developing this kind of infrastructure, thin DOI. It means the DOI can never go away and you are committed to maintaining the resource uh, that, you, that you set up. So this is a, a, a very important aspect. Then of course we need metadata and obviously uh, here we need to have the, 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 the buy-in by the community and the scientists, the producer of, of the data sets to enhance this coverability. This is essential. We need resources such as control vocabularies. We know a lot of us are involved in contributing or uh, supporting uh, the, the development of such resources. Yesterday was mentioned HPO, for instance, the human phenotype ontology, which is extremely important resources now to annotate phenotype, and it's, it's becoming a de facto standard. Uh, we also have to understand the provenance of the information all, all the time. Uh, if you have a, a, a transformation of the data sets in any way, we need to understand what kind of uh, tools that they use, uh, when it has been done. We, we've heard again yesterday the importance of uh, uh, the reference genome versions for uh, making calls. All these kind of things are extremely uh, critical in, in, in the infrastructure that we have built. Uh, of course, we heard about the issue of, of how to access the data, so what are the condi technical conditions for accessing the data themselves, but this is, not, this is only one side of the accessibility of the data. Then we need to understand what kind of uh, activities can I do with the data. So we need also clear licenses that are machine readable, and this is a hard bit. How do we translate a document, uh, a legal document, which can be a long PDF, uh, a two machine uh, readable statement that can be interrogated by agents in unambiguous ways. So this is again a completely open field of research. So now turning fair into reality, this is really where these things have been uh, mentioned yesterday already. We need uh, to develop infrastructure, tools and resources. People are hell bent on doing that. We also need to harmonize the standards, which is an interesting one, because there are so many standards. We need to understand how to use them, which ones are better than others, or which ones are recommended. Uh, so, which leads immediately into a huge uh, need in training and education. <coughs> and of course, uh, the last and probably critical central aspect, we need to overcome the technical and social challenges associated with sharing data. Uh, the, the uh, main benefit of the situation we're in now is that this is no longer optional. We have a strong buy-in by the funding agencies and governments to make this vision a reality. So here I'd like to tell you a bit about a couple of organizations that are spearheading uh, the verification processes or at least testing, uh, uh, pushing to the limit some of these, these aspects. Obviously, Elixir is one such organization. Uh, we've been also interacting with NIH, so this is the big data to knowledge uh, programs or the data common pilot uh, 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 phase consortium, the DCCPC uh, that we are currently running on. And there were two publications at, uh, from our group out of this work which focused mostly on findability of data sets. Uh, the first one was DataMed. Uh, so that was a collaboration with our US collaborators, which was an attempt to build a, 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 the equivalent of PubMed, but for data, data sets and databases, an index of all the, uh, the data sets that, that, that are produced by or archived in, in many well-known uh, repositories. And the associated uh, publication was the, the, the format supporting this, this archive, the DATS format standing for data article suite, which was, in a way, the pendant of the journal article suite used by PubMed. Oh, sorry. And um, the, the other two organizations I already mentioned, the FAPLUS, IMI, uh, so the Innovative Medicine, Medicine Initiative, we all know 3.3 billion euros uh, over the, 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 the period 2014-2020. Uh, at the moment, we are involved in IMI FAPLUS project. Previously, I've been involved in the ETRIX project. Uh, which was a, a project on translational research. So again, the, the problem that we faced in that project was how do we bring uh, data from uh, animal uh, to, to the clinic and, and, and vice versa. So, so this kind of uh, uh, challenges of switching from one area of curation practice to another. Um, Pistoia Alliance I've already mentioned, but uh, uh, so in a way here, uh, to see the uptake as well in the, in the FAWA world, this is a very recent publication by John Wise and colleagues in Drug Discovery Today, 
uh, which discusses uh, the implementation and the impact the fair has on the pharma practice. Uh, so these are huge opportunities for SMEs as well to interact uh, with the pharma industry to provide services around verification processes. And um, really uh, what it takes is uh, we have to have uh, uh, you know, a certain level of financial investment because this is not uh, cheap at all. Uh, to set up the, the infrastructure, uh, we'll say uh, to make use of existing tools and, and device and methods. And the key element, of course, in pharma is to show the value of that uh, transformation. So that's an aspect that will have to be uh, really clear, uh, clearly stated, is that what, why do you want to verify the data in the first place? What are the challenges that you want to meet? And, and really, what are the integration uh, uh, or scientific tasks that you want to perform uh, at the end of the verification, and does the verification process improves the situation over what you have currently uh, with the existing data sets. So I think in pharma, as in academia, the problem is still the mindset, and we still have, this is my data, I don't want to share it at all, and um, uh, this is uh, in companies in, in, in pharma, maybe it's a bit easier to um, uh, apply a level of uh, uh, compassionate tyranny but we will have also to do this um, in academia, and to some extent, we witnessed that in the AMI project that I'm involved, a reticence to, to let go of the data. So, how to do this? Well, we probably need to have a strategy, and this is, again, uh, the feedback from the Pistoia Alliance survey, um, so again, credits to Ian Arrow for this, but this is the kind of uh, uh, statements and, and feedback they obtained, in the sense that, to build uh, this, we need to, the, the main task is to identify internally the data sets that are uh, earmarked for verification. And then, once this has been established, the catalog of resources then perform the process itself. Um, and then, obviously, uh, this is the, the, the point of the verification when, when the rubber hits the road somehow, uh, where we, once the data sets have been identified, to apply this kind of ETLs, uh, glorified ETLs that produce um, RDF lead data, I guess, um, I mean, is, is the ultimate goal of the verification process. So, in this context, we need a huge amount of resources to um, somehow perform this task. One of them is a key, is the conceptual models, the control vocabularies, but this is not enough. We also need um, a community agreements between the minimum information checklist, for instance, to understand the amount of metadata that one needs to provide. And again, yesterday, from the talk of Professor Deladona, we could see that a huge amount of metadata is required, and sometimes it's, you need more because you don't understand the error model of the platform. Uh, and this is really a, a, a critical issue that we need to, get to, to keep in mind. And that could inform also the procurement um, aspects and challenge uh, some of the brands' claim by uh, asking for evidence. Um, the problem with the standards is that there are way too many of them. Um, this is the list of catalog of standards that we have counted in fair sharing. We have over 1,300, all communities <coughs> confounded, say. Uh, and of course, we also have a tension between uh, standards that are unique. Industry strength, I guess. Um, in the world of uh, CDs, ISO standards, HL7. So if you're operating in a clinical context, you know all these uh, standards and you will be uh, forced by the regulator to somehow comply with it. Um, but there are gaps. I mean, if you're working in, in, in genomics with omics data, this coverage here, the coverage of, of, of the standardization effort is just initiating. Um, CDs has a pharmaceutical genomic component, but it doesn't cover everything. And then you have to therefore to rely on what we call academic standards, the ones that are produced by the scientists themselves. Uh, and of course, these are two different processes, and sometimes uh, for a company, they develop tools, which one should they pick? And so this kind of cross-talk is uh, extremely important to, to bear in mind, and also, I presume, uh, before allocating resources to understand the market. So the aspect here, uh, there are two, two points I'd like to make. The first point is that there is a need of convergence between probably more cross-talk between these two worlds, the world of industry standard and the world of academic standards. Um, but also from the academic standpoint, this is working in a standard area is not necessarily well-supported activity, when, whereas the needs are huge. 
So a message back to the funding agencies could also be, well, we, we need to let scientists work on this. Uh, on, on these activities because this is in a way tasks that are necessary to support uh, the data science um, life cycle. And the other uh, uh, point is that uh, this cross talk needs to happen, the convergence of standards need to, uh, to happen and uh, I guess uh, from SME's point of view it could be an interesting aspect to, show, to, to be able to showcase to potential customers that you are standard compliant. Uh, meaning that you you leave the the, the potential customer uh, at ease in terms of there will there will not be uh, vendor locking. You would be able to demonstrate if you don't want to work with us anymore, you are still able to access your data or export it in the format that is open that could be loaded in another system. Um, and I think that possibly could be an incentive. And I guess working with industry or closer to software or vendor manufacturers. Uh, especially if you're working with procurement, one aspect that would be really, really important for the verification of the data, I think, is to make sure that uh, software vendors are able to produce open format, uh, community uh, compliant format, that are susceptible to speed up or lower the cost of public data deposition, for instance. That's one uh, parameter that could be considered in procurement contracts. So this uh, catalog fair sharing that we are actually running um, uh, in Oxford is uh, a UK, Elixir UK resource. And we are, the, the resources are manually curated by the team and we keep updating the records, trying to show not only uh, the, the list and the survey of, of, of the standards that are available as well, but also to showcase that uh, some of them are implemented by actual services, databases. So you can see a level of acceptance and gauge uh, the quality or take of the formats and standards that are um, produced in the world. So now I switch uh, to another topic, which is the IMI Fair Plus, which brings, uh, as all IMI projects, a number of EFPA partners with academic labs, and um, which is in a way led by Elixir uh, uh, in Cambridge, UK. Um, and basically, one of the activities that we are in charge of is to provide a document, um, a, you know, a set of practices and guidelines on how to perform verification processes. Um, here we have started, um, so this is the organization of the project where we have a work package one which connects closely with the uh, EFBA partners trying to get as many uh, input uh, to identify data sets. We've already worked uh, about four different data sets produced by IMI projects. And we, in a way, test uh, the level of maturity of a number of tools and resources to see their fitness for purpose in the verification process. This is what we call uh, the CMMI model, so the capacity maturity model. So let's take an example. Uh, you have data in, um, in free text. How do you bring this data in free text to a level of uh, semantic annotation? So how do you identify standards? What are the tools to do the markup, to, to do the entity recognition uh, and semantic markup? And uh, are they good enough? So these are the kind of things. And what are the costs, obviously, of performing this task, which are, again, uh, things that are critical uh, for engaging on the path of verification, uh, whether at grant writing time, to take into account that burden that has been placed somehow by the organizations. But when you uh, write up a grant, I think these kind of uh, extra curation tasks need to be factored in and could be, again, opportunities for SMEs. Um, yes, so on this uh, hand side here, uh, we have currently a mandate to start interacting with at least 20 IMI projects uh, by the end of the project. So this will be a good process for documenting and harvesting uh, experience uh, about the verification process. And these are the kind of uh, workflow that we uh, run. We start negotiating the condition of access and how to deal with this. After that, we also still uh, need to interact with the pro data provider to understand what are the use cases and why the integration process uh, is needed and what kind of challenges uh, they want to run. The identification of the data type, this is to gear the kind of transformation we need to do, uh, identify, okay, if you are doing DNA microarrays or if you are doing uh, fMRI, what kind of standard is in the field that you need to be aware of until uh, the, the completion of, of, of this process and, of course, the OSCE. Um, uh, uh, and, and doing 
where the data will eventually live. This is where we work with our colleagues at the University of Luxembourg, who are actually providing all the storage uh, for this consortium and the project. Uh, oh my God! Uh, uh, so five minutes. Uh, so uh, this is uh, really um, a, a key point. So, um, and in a way, from this interaction with our uh, um, colleagues from industry, I think the huge, the main need that has been identified is around ontology mapping. And this is really um, uh, probably no surprise to any, anyone in the room. Uh, but this is what will be, in a way, a bit keeping us busy for the next few years. Uh, I think in, 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 in the a so big project will be uh, starting to do this. And all this experience will be collated in what we call the FERP cookbook, basically, which is um, a kind of resource for like, training and guidance. And here we've really uh, followed the community practice. Uh, we, followed, <coughs> we chose to use Jupyter book on the technical side. Uh, just uh, because it's, it's fairly easy to develop, to deploy, we have traceability. Uh, we, we follow the lead of the Alan Turing Institute book of data science. Uh, we expect to deliver, uh, we have already a number of examples of kind of recipes that uh, how we transform the data from different projects. We we'll also have a recent biohackathon uh, funded by Alexia in, 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 uh, in Paris, in Paris. We reach out to the car countries and the galaxy training community. So this is um, again uh, fostering interaction. So in the last five minutes, I think I will tell you about this example of verification that I told you about earlier on. So I think one of the problems that we have is that we keep doing these kind of things, extracting chemical identities from PDF files, bed tables, and this is this is particularly tedious and not very interesting. We need to have better ways to output this information from our workflows. Um, and, and in a way, uh, the example that I gave you, that I will give you here, is kind of work that we did uh, following publication of the Rose Genome uh, in, in last year, in, in, in June 2018. Um, there was a side uh, complementation of, 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 of the genomic information in the, in the form of a GCMS profile of, of the scent of various cultivars of roses in different uh, parts of the, of the flower. And the file is actually available as an Excel uh, file in a supplementary document. And of course, supplementary documents on, on, on this kind of publications are extremely uh, um, unstable. You use the link. So the first thing we really did was, was to put it on, on Zenodo. So we stick it on Zenodo, we get a DOI. Uh, the first issue of findability is addressed. We, we have stability as well, and we have a stable identifier. And we've got metadata uh, following the data site. Uh, uh, requirements. But let's have a look at the table itself. So it looks like this, and it has a lot of uh, problems. So for humans, it, has, it is very easy to understand this information. We've got a header here that contains information about a protocol, and then we've got a table. Here we've got the dimension of molecules. Here we've got some kind of measurements, average, we've got numerical values, we've got gaps, we've got missing values. And here we've got two rows of gaps, we don't know why they are here, but then uh, we have this uh, element here. And for a human, it's obvious that these are uh, the cultivar of, of, uh, of rows, and then we've got an organism part. So, of course, to, to machines, this is completely opaque, and we need to, to do something about it. So, the first step is to understand uh, the kind of transformation. So, in this exercise, I chose to explore the use of a syntax, which is called frictionless uh, data um, uh, packages. It's developed by the Open Knowledge Foundation, uh, and it's used actually widely, but it was an interesting test case to see could it be used in the context of biological data to store uh, omic profile, for instance. And then I looked at, okay, what do we need in terms of semantic? Oh, I need to add one thing. Uh, the challenge here is that I had to, to use existing tools. I tried to uh, absolutely uh, not develop software myself, but try to use resources that were available out of the box. So just to, to minimize the workload. So here, in terms of semantics, I've identified uh, the statistical ontology, for instance, uh, KB for chemical identities, taxonomy for the plant part, and uh, plant ontology for the plant part. And of course, the transformation is first step we convert to friction this um, um, matrix that we have to a frictionless data package that we can then and we give it a UI and then we transform that to RDF link data uh, complete uh, uh, and so the data package here uh, I need to tell you a couple of insights into the, uh, the technical aspects uh, allows you to keep 
the familiarity with the comma separated file, so that's a CSV, that's easy, everybody knows that, but it tops it up with a JSON document that fully defines the header of the file. So basically, this is uh, the verified aspect of the previous matrix. You can see the layout is different, it's a, it's a, a, a mouse version of it, um, where basically another property of the JSON data package is that it's a fixed width table. I mean, in, the, in the long format. So you have no flexibility. You can't add columns once you have defined a data package, but you have a full clarity about the data. So all these fields that you could see in the previous slide, all the headers, are defined by the JSON document that you can see here. The interesting aspect is that immediately, out of the box, you've got information about, you, you are reminded that you need to provide a license. You need to provide information about uh, people who've done that, who are the owners. But also you can define every, specifically every single field in that matrix. Especially, you can define the type, you can define the constraint, and you can also specify an RDF type directly into that definition. Which makes you a bit closer to the, um, um, to the fair status. So, really, the key things here were to identify syntax, choose the syntax, commit to it, and again, for the semantic framework, try to be consistent. Here I chose uh, ontologies which are interoperable, which belong to the same framework. And of course, one aspect of the organizing principle is that I had to uh, specifically focus on the study design information. And I think this is really a, an interesting aspect that allows you to uh, immediately have an insight into the sample sizes that were used to make compute the mean. Uh, you know whether it's technical replicate or a biological replicate, and this is really something that is surprisingly not tapped into the information about the study design um, in large repositories like this. That could be a very, very good principle for organizing data and metadata as well to allow you to see through a large amount of data set and decide whether you want to include this element. The code as well has been released through GitHub and DOI, so you can have access to the entire section. Uh, and I will finish, sorry I'm running live, but uh, I, I will finish with this last tool, which is a fair evaluator, which is produced, uh, which has been written by Mark Wilkinson at the University of Madrid, uh, the lead author on all these uh, fair papers, and Dominique Batista has worked on the front end um, in our group. Uh, this is a fairly uh, ruthless and merciless tool that will uh, really assess the fairness of your data sets. It's completely automated. It relies on following the links that you provide in, in, in your document. And will provide a report uh, based on the fair metrics, the, the, the fair definitions, and will give you uh, a, a full assessment. And this is, I say, merciless because then when you run your data into this tool, you will realize that making data fair is a lot harder than we think. And, uh, it's a path. We need to understand how to play with this, and we need to understand that the infrastructure is not probably ready yet, and we need a lot of efforts to uh, deliver the, the, the vision. So, uh, yes, I acknowledge all the, the people uh, that have contributed to this work, and I will stop here and take any questions. Thank you very much.